Um, welcome to Kellogg, everyone. And my name is David Howard. I'm a fellow of the college, and I'm involved in the Global Centre on Urban on Healthcare and Urbanisation. Um, the centre is based in Kellogg. It was established in September of last year, and its main aim is to bring together some of the research and teaching strengths of the college, particularly within the fields of sustainable urban development and evidence-based healthcare. Uh, the centre has um, six public seminars a year, which you'll hear one of them. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, once every two months, effectively. And this year, the series has been broadly on the, on the topic of um, healthy cities. And today, we'll be looking at delivering, delivering uh, healthcare, particularly in the context of rapid urbanisation. Um, and so we're delighted to have our four speakers here today. Uh, they'll be introduced by our chair, Annette Bluderman, who's uh, a fellow of Kellogg. So we'll move over to the speakers in a second. The format will be essentially each speaker has been asked to respond or make a prov provocative response to the question, are we facing healthcare crisis in cities in the context of rapid urbanisation? And so in many days, today I guess, if we think of rapid urbanisation, often it's in the context of the so-called global south, the majority world, uh, uh, you know, the statistics will show that 90% of the urban population growth uh, by 2050 will be in uh, uh, Asia and Africa. But historically, we can think about uh, rapid urbanisation, let's say, in parts of Europe as well. So Isl in Islington, the population of Islington increased sixfold between 1703 to 1790. Uh, and that, in, that created issues of how to adapt to this rapid population growth. Uh, rapid increase in built environment and all the issues raised about sanitation, increasing housing quality and the built in, quality of the built environment. So the issues of rapid urbanisation are not purely today, they've been with us uh, historically and the four speakers today bring a variety of skills uh, from practitioners and researchers in healthcare through to architecture and, and development, uh, de development matters. Development matters. So I'm delighted uh, to have, us all, have you all here today. Um, the format will be each speaker will have their 10 minutes pitch to provoke your thoughts. Uh, there'll be time then for questions and answers, hopefully, or just questions really. Um, uh, and then for half an hour or so, then there are um, refreshments and beverages uh, here provided for you to linger longer. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand you over to Annette, who will be chairing the session. Thanks very much, David. And I'd like to join him in welcoming you all here. It's really great to see all of you. And I think we've got some really fantastic speakers lined up for a very interesting question on the healthcare, potential healthcare crises in cities. And just to reiterate, we'll have all of them give their, their 10 minutes, and then we'll have questions after at the end, if that's all right. So I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, who is Lucy Stevens from Practical Action, a UK-based charity which is looking at improving lives and healthcare <coughs> in urban slum communities. Okay, so, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, David. It's been, a, it's, it's great to be here. One of the things that I think is really interesting is actually the point that you raise about rapid urbanisation not only being happening now, but it's an issue that has raised uh, issues around healthcare over the years and uh, I think it's interesting to note that when the great stink of London happened in 1858 um, and the Houses of Parliament had to close because of the smell from the sanitation it was only at that point despite outbreaks of cholera previously that actually uh, investment was put in and basil jets sewers were built and uh, you know that, that we're still using today so I mean one of the things that I, I think we might come back to at the end of my talk is whether it whether um, it's when some of the health crises begin to affect the whole of the population that there's a greater impetus for action. Um, I think, though, that thinking about what's happening in, uh, in my focus in terms of the towns and cities of the developing world and the health crises, I'm going to talk more about the health crises as, as much as the health care issues around them, that there are some things which are changing. So what is changing now? What's different now from what's been happening before? One of them is that urbanisation is, is, uh, is happening rapidly. The world is urbanising. And let's not imagine that this is, you know, millions of people upping sticks from villages and traipsing to towns as if, in, you know, in a Dick Whittington kind of a way. No, there is a big youth bulge already in, in the cities of, Afri of Africa and Asia. And just by the very nature of some of, some of those people having maybe one or two children, that's a big increase in the population. And at the same time, there are lots of small rural village villages which are becoming bigger and bigger and now being counted as towns. 
where there is no kind of proper setup uh, and they're beginning to have to become municipalities and take on new responsibilities that they're not equipped for and don't have the resources to cope with. These are some of the, the issues that we need to, to think about in, <coughs> in the context. I think also the world is becoming increasingly unequal. So where you have statistics which say uh, the mortality rate for children under five in this city is this, that's pretty meaningless actually because because there'll be a huge difference between the better off areas and the slum communities. And the, the figure in the middle doesn't really mean anything. So uh, what do we do about this, uh, the, these inequalities where in growing numbers of people living in uh, slum communities? But in a way, there's, there's good news too, okay? Because some of, the, some of the biggest issues that are affecting people, uh, the majority of people who are living in towns and cities in the developing world, are uh, preventable. Those health issues are preventable. So there are lots of things to do with waterborne diseases, vector-borne diseases, and also poor air quality increasingly being recognised as uh, being the result as, as leading to huge numbers of deaths, which is partly caused by uh, you know, transportation and industrial pollution, but also uh, cooking on open fires, which still happens in, and, and uh, smoky fires, which happens in, in cities and is recognised as a huge problem. So are there any figures that we can put to this, this health crisis? Well, uh, some studies were done back in uh, 2002 in Nairobi. They've actually been repeated more recently, I'll come to that later, um, where they found that the mortality rate for under fives in slum communities, uh, and they compared it with the rest of the city. So for under fives in the slum communities, it was 136 per thousand, compared to 60 for the rest of the city. A huge, huge difference. And what were some of the reasons for that? Well, th th all, the things, all the things you would expect. But I want to put a bit of a human face on this. A couple of years ago, uh, I, and I've, I, can, I can picture it vividly, I was visiting a, uh, some of the work that we do in the city of Kisumu on, uh, in Kenya, Western Kenya by uh, Lake Kisumu, um, with some work that we're doing to try to work on water, sanitation, hygiene, and improving the health of uh, children under five. So we visited a young couple. They had babies, uh, who, little babies, girls who were twins, and a little boy who was a toddler. Uh, definitely a two-person job, okay? Three children, any one with three children under five, it's a two-person job. There was the dad looking that kind of like bleary and sleep deprived and uh, trying to kind of hold things together. Uh, and the mum holding up well, but like worn down. They'd just come back from having uh, a bout with the twins of, uh, of diarrhea and vomiting as, as you know, anybody gets. But um, also dealing with a toddler who was at the stage where they just want to wander around and play and pick up things and explore in a context where the house would have been so hard to keep clean. And outside in the streets, the mud lanes and between the shacks, heaps of rubbish, pools of standing water, mosquitoes, open drains um, with a sewage seeping from the shared latrines. There are things that you can do in that context. But it's inevitable that that's going to create a health crisis. The, the amount of pathogens and the pathways for pathogens to reach people are only now being explored by researchers. And they're just being found to be not just if you take E. coli, but they're found to be everywhere. So what did this family do if they wanted to wash their hands? Well, they had to, get to, they had to reach for the, the, the stored jerry can of water that was in one corner. Then they had to get the big basin out and a, a little pouring jug. Then they had to reach for the soap. The soap was kept up on the top of somewhere because he didn't want it to get all soggy because uh, it's really valuable and you use it for all kind of things. Uh, then you needed a two-person job with somebody to pour while you washed uh, and then you had to put it all away again. Um, and somebody had had to go and fetch the water uh, so you didn't want to use too much of it. So you didn't really want to let your toddler explore with playing with the water because you had to go and fetch that water and it cost you money. So. If you could tell me a million times to wash my hands in that context, and I would know that it would be a great idea to wash my hands at the right moments, but there might still be times when I would think, really, really, this is too hard. You know? And that's why you find that, 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 that it's, you, we need to find innovative ways to help people overcome some of these kinds of barriers. What is the healthcare situation like in that town I'm, I'm describing? Well, I think one thing we need to know is that not all healthcare facilities, in fact, only half of healthcare facilities in Africa have basic water supply on the premises. And 30% of healthcare facilities in Africa have no sanitation facility at all. 
So how can you provide a, you know, that, that, that's a huge issue in terms of providing a healthcare situation. Healthcare people st struggle in these contexts as well because there's a moving population. People move a lot. How can you trace people from one time to another to follow up on immunizations, to follow up with house-to-house -house visits, to check how they're doing with their young family um, in, that sort of, in that sort of context? People are out during the day. They have to earn a living. They may not be at their house, so you might need to visit later in the evening. But then you might find that if you're not known in the community, you might fight, face security issues. These are all some of the difficulties that people find in accessing some of those, um, some of that healthcare. But there are things that can be done. I mentioned this study in Nairobi, the difference between slum communities and the rest. They went back in 2012, and they found that from 136 uh, under five deaths per thousand, it had come down to 80. <coughs> So there'd been a huge drop. What had been the cause of that drop? They, it still, was still worse than the rest of the city, and it was still worse than some of the rest of the country, but at least the gap was closing. What had they managed to do? They'd managed to improve with some free access for maternal and antenatal health um, checkups so that women were actually getting some health advice at the same time. Uh, some improved immunisation coverage and work by the Water and Sanitation Company and others to improve access to water and sanitation. So... Things can be done. I think our experience in practical action is one where we're finding that what you need is sort of innovative solutions that really address some of the systemic problems that you need to both work with the government systems because they are the ones that are sustained and they're in the, and they're in, in, in the country, but combine that with involving a small army of community health volunteers and workers listening properly to what people's needs are and how you could help them overcome some of these situations that we described of finding it difficult to access clean water, of, of, of struggling to keep you know, washing your hands when you need to. Very basic things. <coughs> Designing the right kinds of solutions that will work with them that. And finding and tapping into the energy of small enterprises, local artisans, um, and unleashing some of that creativity so that people who are sometimes described as being the problem actually become a key part of the solution, because they are the solution. They are the ones with the energy and the, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the solutions that could bring a change. At the global level, there's still not enough investment. Uh, the, a global assessment of investment in water and sanitation says that only 6% goes to hygiene, and two years ago it was only 1% of global investments in water and sanitation go to the hygiene part of it. So investments in primary, in those kinds of primary solutions that could really turn the tide on some of this are just not quite there. And, in the, and then I think coming back to the point I made at the beginning, there are things around the climate crisis, right? And the climate crisis, the climate emergency, is creating a situation where there are cities, a few cities around the world, but maybe there'll be more, that are running out of water. Cape Town hit the headlines day zero. That was a context where every single person in the city, the rich and the very poor, the poor suffered more, but the very rich also felt the effect of running, the city running out of water. Maybe it made people think about what, the, what, the, what this situation means. In context of extreme heat and poor air quality, everybody suffers from poor air quality and there's no escaping it. Maybe these will be some of the triggers that will also help to galvanise action. I want to just end with a thought, which is, what if? What, what if we could get to a situation where where there had been the right kinds of investments, where those different stakeholders had been activated and their energies harnessed. And despite people still having inequalities of income and living in poverty, they could have the clean water, decent toilet, easy hand washing, clean air and place to cook. That is actually some of their human rights. Just imagine what that could do in terms of freeing up people's energy, freeing up their time, freeing up the money that they're spending on, on, on dealing with these health care vision issues and what that could do in terms of the, uh, a vision for a, a more sustainable future for our urban world. There you go. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Hubert Lim. Lam, sorry, yes. Hubert. <laughs> and he's from the Nuffield Department of Population Health. Yes. Just based here in Oxford. Thanks very much, Hubert. Okay. Good evening. And I don't know whether my talk is provocative, but I'm not really talking about healthcare, nor crisis, 
probably that's provocative enough. And uh, so I'm trying to spend uh, the next 10 minutes or so trying to convince you uh, that um, urban healthy living is not something that is quite easily measured or studied. Because as an ep epidemiologist and uh, with some interest in air pollution or well, environmental epidemiology, you know, uh, we are mostly concerned about how to uh, associate health with various um, noxious exposures, in this case, air pollution. So I'm bringing you to uh, uh, the city called Suzhou in, um, in China. It, you probably may not have heard of the city. It's a really nice uh, historical town. And, uh, but surprisingly, well, of course, in China, everything is huge. You know, it has a population, basically, like the UK minus uh, England. So all their home country, uh, nations you know, added together, apart from England, is uh, Suzhou's population. So it's not small, in fact. And so you could see, uh, this is uh, in the eastern coast of China, so not far away from Shanghai, you know, about 100 kilometers away. And um, it's, um, as I said, it's a medium-sized city. And, but this city has a very high human uh, development index. Um, according to uh, the figure, it's uh, 0.894, which basically means that it has a pretty good uh, life expectancy, pretty good education, pretty good um, per capita income. Now, <laughs> in one of our studies that we, we went to Suzhou among uh, some other regions in China to try to find out the what we call the exposure, you know, how people actually cook, how people actually, you know, uh, uh, keep warm, and, you know, those kind of uh, exposures they have, because we want to ascertain how such exposures could be related to the health subsequently. So we went there and uh, we had some measurements. But uh, before we introduce, you know, the, the uh, giving you the results, I uh, want to show you something first. Um, mm. the Oops, the sorry. So the Old Town of Suzhou is just in the middle of the, um, uh, the map. So we are focusing in an area just outside the, the Old Town, you know, so, sort of suburb. And this is the satellite image of that particular um, rectangle here. And the red line running across it is a metro line. So not surprisingly, in a Chinese city <coughs> nowadays, there are metros everywhere. And bear in mind, this is in the suburb, so it is not in the cent center of the city. Th but there is um, a metro line, the red line across it. And in the southern, um, south part of the metro line, you can see um, multi-story apartment blocks, brand new, you know, as of uh, 2017. So you can see the, the uh, median verge is still not green because they are still developing it. All the tarmacs basically are uh, newly laid out. There's also a very decent, well-equipped uh, community hospital, uh, as you can see, uh, just next to the apartment blocks, maybe about 500 meters away, something like that. The northern part, you can see very closely, um, densely populated uh, settlements. You know, what are these uh, uh, areas? So this is actually uh, more like urban villages. These are the people well, they leave the people who used to be scattered around in this region, you know, in a rural, more rural part area. You know, they used to farm, but obviously a city develops and, and uh, absorbs the neighborhoods um, surrounding it. They become urbanized. And the, big, uh, they, and the government uh, basically then builds these houses to accommodate these people as a sort of compensation so that the land can be freed up for those kind of developers. And you might not see, you know, I circle in that uh, picture here, there's a gentleman uh, there. And what was he doing? Now, this picture shows what he's doing. Now, outside his house, he's gathering wood here <coughs> and burning them. What for? For boiling water. Now, these houses were probably built maybe in the early 2000s in, well, a very decent city here. You would definitely expect, and I'm sure, and I can guarantee there's electricity and gas supply. Why was this gentleman burning wood outside his house, boiling water, is it because he couldn't have access to electricity and gas? No, purely because this is how he had been doing for the entire life, basically. He just could not stop the practice. And of course, you know, one important thing is it's cheap and it's free, basically. They collect, he'd collected all these wood from you know, surroundings, you know, the, the waste, basically, to just burn them. You know, that, that's really, really nice. And I, I've told you, you know, this is just about 500 meters. You know, within 500 meters, you've got this almost like 
uh, you know, very modern city with these high rises where absolutely there's nothing but gas and electricity. And with someone actually burning wood 500 meters away. So, I mean, what, what the, the take-home message here in the first part of my talk here is when we talk about urban health, well, we would go and, and find out, you know, the health of the people, measure them and look at the environment, yeah? It's quite easy and straightforward and find out, oh, these people are healthy or not. But we have to consider their past exposure and experience because these are the people who suddenly become urbanised or move to an urban area relatively recently. And we know that for health, you know, like if someone smoke, you won't expect that person to get all the harmful effects the next day. It will take decades <coughs> to get the harmful effects. So if we are going to measure the health right now, we might not actually be uh, measuring the actual benefits of urbanization, if there is any. We might be considering, oh, there is harm, but it may actually refers to some of the past exposures they might have previously. So that, that's uh, one of the issues that we have. So we have to consider you know, all sorts of exposure in the past, which is not always very straightforward. Now, in China, although the government doesn't want to show you know, it's a developing country, although sometimes it would say so, but very often it would show you pictures of Shanghai and Beijing with all these skyscrapers, you know, all these modern cities. But the fact is, of course, lots of people still burning what we call solid fuels, like wood or coal, for cooking and heating, particularly in rural areas of China, in the, in the central and the, in the western part of China. You know, this is taken from uh, one of the rural sites in uh, western China, in Gansu province, and they're burning wood. So it is a rural area, of course. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to hide. So these are... Um, Again, rural households from Henan province in, the, in central um, in China, they're burning coal because of the uh, easy access to the coal mines in Shanxi, which is next to Henan. So they're burning coal, and of course the government is blaming a lot of these people, pr um, polluting the, the country, and they, they banned them from burning coal for heating. But anyway, in 2017, they were still allowed to do that, although um, you know, they, it, it's starting to crack down. But they were using coal, and you can see um, various um, styles of kitchen, if you like. You know, of course, in this country, we're talking about German kitchen or whatever kitchen. We're talking about, you know, the, the appliances, you know, almost like the, you know, the, the way how it's uh, furnished. But when you look at the kitchens like this, it's not just about how it's furnished, but about you know, how primitive it can be. And, of course, you know, we have got, um, you know, guest users. And uh, these pictures are taken from Suzhou, you know, as I've introduced you earlier. It's a city, but even within a city, you can have very diverse kind of uh, kitchens, you might expect. But even when, when we say, you know, kitchens, they're not necessarily all indoors. You know, some of them actually cooking outdoors. And one thing that I have to mention is that uh, uh, previous uh, speaker, Lucy, has mentioned the use of open fires for cooking. And in fact, you know, the... The reason why we're so interested in looking at the, the exposure is that, that these um, solid fuel, when we burn, you know, they're very efficient, inefficient, so they generate a lot of smoke. And uh, people are concerned about air pollution, and th this is real air pollution. You know, you're, you're almost like burning cigarettes in front of you for very long periods of time, and uh, you, you are inhaling those kind of smoke for decades, not just you know, minutes or seconds. So, it might not be a bad idea, in fact, you know, to, to burn it outside so that it is you know, not confined, so that you know, the, it could be uh, uh, dispersed. Uh, and of course, if you have to cook indoors, uh, it's, I, I guess it's um, uh, something nice to have ventilation. You know, you, if you don't have cooker hood, you would open a window. The problem in, in Henan is in summer, it's very hot. In winter, it's very cold. So you don't want to lose heat. What you can do is to shut the windows. Now what, what happens is if you cook with the window shut when you're burning coal, it is smoky, you know, as simple as that. Now of course, you know, um, the more uh, affluent people would have uh, ventilation fans, I've highlighted in uh, this particular figure here. 
But on this particular figure here, when I highlight it here, it's not a fan. What is it? It's a hole. It's a hole in the wall. So they are, they are relying on you know, very passive means of ventilation because they, they won't, don't want to open the window so widely, so they lose it. So they would drill a hole in the wall. You know, same holds true you know, for some other, um, you know, the living room, for example, where they have a coal burning um, heat stove for keeping warm. And what they do in summer is they, they dismantle it. In winter, they would uh, they, they put it here and put a duct you know, connected to the window, hole in the window, so that it could have you know, the exhaust going out. But I told you, you know, we, we took all these pictures in summer 20, 2017, in summer, and it was um, boiling hot, 36 or 7 degrees. You know, so nobody would have been using coal for heating, no need. When we went you know, to the courtyard, not even went to the house you know, itself, we could smell sulfur. You know, where the sulfur coming from? Burning of coal. You know, that's coming from the kitchen, basically. So you can see that the, you know, it just leaks everywhere. And just imagine those kids born in that such environment and women, you know, cooking, you know, for so many years. What is the kind of exposure they have? Now, we, we, we are, well, I'll show you some measurement data later on. And so you can also see, you know, in the same province, in the Henan province, there are people with a very nice kitchen, you know, guest kitchen, uh, and uh, with a very nice um, cooking hood. And so, you know, the, the disparity here is insane. And it's, we are talking one single village. We are not talking about, you know, one neighborhood versus another one. It's, it's the same village. And we have such huge disparity here. Now, if urbanization is about or it's all about improving the infrastructure so that people can live what we call urban lifestyle, it's similar to what we live in the, in the West. I would say, absolutely, why not? Because why do we want to have this? Why do we want to have you know, wood burning, coal burning? You know, we should all switch to gas burning. We should all have you know, such very nice ventilation you know, to safeguard you know, our, our kids you know, uh, and, of course, ourselves. Now, as I said, we have some measurement data here. So in 2017, uh, we went to three regions, China. You know, we then followed 450 people. We gave them a sampler to measure their PM2.5, which is the fine particulate matter, you know, which is all you know, used to, uh, you know, to assess the M in air pollution. We, l we tried to look at this. And then we also have a sensor placed in the household, in the living room, basically, and in the kitchen. And of course, one that they carry all the time. So we, we sort of trying to find out what kind of exposure they have over five days. What that we're showing here is uh, over a period of 24 hours, so on a typical 24 hour period here. So here is, uh, is data from Suzhou where people are burning gas primarily. And I put the mean annual um, PM2.5 in Beijing, and you have read in the news that Beijing has been cited like New Delhi and other places in, in, uh, in Asia, has been very polluted. Now, the annual PM2.5 level in Beijing 2017 was uh, 57 microgram per cubic meter. Now, for Suzhou, and we have got the warm season and cool season, because we, we, we know that in, in summer and winter they have different practices. Yeah, so some may be burning uh, uh, for heating. You can see, yes, uh, in, in cold season, you know, a cool season, in fact, you know, the, the exposure level is higher, you know, it's double that. It's not surprising. What is quite interesting is that uh, for the outdoor kind of exposure level, it's not too different from the indoor level, the personal level, it, despite the fact that people are staying most time indoors. So eight, nine, up to even 90 something percent of the time spending you know, indoors. So it's very similar. So it doesn't matter whether you go out or you stay home, you know, it, it's the same. But the this thing is very different in rural areas. Now, in rural areas, you can see um, in um, the middle part is the Henan, where they primarily burn coal. And you can see, in fact, the ambient pollution, well, so-called ambient PM2.5 level is lower than the household level and where most, as I said, most people tend to stay much longer. And in fact, it was even worse in Gansu where people burn wood. 
and, subs and notice the scale, the y-axis, the vertical axis here, because it was so high that I have to change the scale. So, you know, I couldn't even put that uh, dotted line across it because you would hardly see that. This is so low. And in contrast, in, in Oxford, where our council has been saying you know, it's very polluted, you have to do something about it, is 18 microgram per cubic meter in 2018. And in Sydney, in, in, in Australia, where they said it's a whoo, huge uh, bushfire and all the rest of things, Sydney, in the worst hour, they've only, when I say only, recorded 400 cubic, uh, microgram per cubic meter. Just one reading here. And these people, they are breathing in that level 24-7. So I, I want to, to make my pitch here saying, you know, I, I understand, yes, urbanization probably is something that people don't like uh, because they, they are saying ruining our countryside, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, uh, a lot of other issues. But if urbanization, as I said, is about improving the standard of living, making sure, you know, they have access to clean fuel, they have got, they've got more decent, you know, life, then I'll definitely advocate it. But of course, we have to make sure that we are not moving these people from rural areas into urban slums. You know, this is very, very important. So we don't want them to move from one chapter to another. So thank you very much. I would love to introduce uh, Michaela Patrick, who is an architectural designer and researcher with STEMA. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. So when I got the brief for this talk, I was trying to think about what to, to talk about. And, and, you know, I think most people here who are interested in this topic would, would agree that it's fairly obvious that the healthcare challenges of rapid urbanization are complex. They're also something that are constantly changing and shifting, particularly now in the face of our planet's constantly changing ecosystem. I'd also like to say that I think the most prevalent and extreme challenges of health in, in cities exist in conditions of low resources. So as an example, the cities urbanizing most rapidly also are associated with a rapid growth in informal settlements which then in turn present unique health challenges and large health inequalities. So our work at STEMA looks at understanding the health challenges and inequalities experienced by communities living in low resource settings through systems and community led approaches to research. We've been working on a series of case studies to build knowledge on the broader factors that impact on communities health and well-being. So this is kind of with the mindset that these big scale problems with facing, we might find the solutions by zooming down to the small scale and working with those most disadvantaged who have the best and most unique understanding of the problems they're facing and are therefore best positioned to provide the kind of innovative solutions we might need. I'd like to talk through one of our case studies to draw out a sense of the system of challenges faced by communities in these low resource settings. Within this, I'll be talking about a spectrum of health challenges from physical to also mental health using the experience of a particular health condition. So this piece of research was a partnership with the SHM Foundation located in Pretoria in South Africa. It came about after a workshop reflecting on the impact of an anonymous peer-to-peer -peer messaging service for adolescents with HIV in urban South Africa. The idea was to conduct participatory spatial research with these adolescents who've been using the service to understand where, when and how it fits within the bigger picture of their lives. So a bit of background or context. HIV is one of the most persisting and challenging health conditions in urban South Africa, with one in five people living with the condition. It's also the leading cause of death for adolescents and is linked to a broad set of physical, social and psychological needs. Adolescents are particularly vulnerable to mental health risks and treatment adherence is less successful within this demographic. Some of the major issues associated with the condition are isolation and stigma. Um, and in low resource urban settings, this can be exacerbated by people living in, in close proximity to relatives who they might not have disclosed their condition to. The formal healthcare system is not always able to meet the wider needs of these adolescents, which is 
exacerbating this issue of medication adherence, which is crucial to living ha happily and healthily with HIV. Adolescents are not motivated or supported to manage their condition as best they can. So in 2013, the SHM Foundation developed the Kaluma Project to try and address this gap in care, providing an anonymous space of support and communication for adolescents <coughs> through a text message service. At times, counsellors and other experts also participate in the groups to offer support and advice. The project uncovered that while adolescents reported not struggling with medication adherence, the actual day-to-day -day lived experience was different. The Kaluma project was described by the adolescent mentors who ran and facilitated the groups as a home. And this was the starting point for some participatory spatial research on how the service was actually used. To do this, we wanted to step back and understand the bigger picture of all the various parts of their lives, the people, the places, and the different things adolescents would draw on for their health and well-being. We developed a conceptual framework that we called Spaces of Care to explore this. So what we did is over a, a series of workshops, we looked at encounters of care across four different scales, which you can some of which you can see documented on this slide. So looking at the urban scale of how they encounter the city, the building scale, the different buildings they're using throughout their day-to-day -day lives, the human scale, both in terms of their personal lives and, and who they interact with, and then the scale of the object. The most clear conclusion from the research was that the spaces the adolescents felt the least healthy and felt the least sense of care and support was the hospital. That was the space of the most negative feelings. <coughs> this is for various reasons, but it's all tied up in complex factors around limited human resources. Adolescents sit within a particularly complex age group that at around age 15, they're discharged from the paediatric ward where they receive kind of closer care and support to the adult care ward where they become kind of the lowest rung in the ladder and they're kind <coughs> of made to wait the longest. They're also sort of not treated with the kind of support and care they might need. So we wanted to kind of step back from these negative experiences and think about what the positive places and experiences within the city they might be, might be finding. What we found was that the spaces that they drew these positive experiences from were not to do with necessarily the physical properties of that space, but it was how they were used. So adolescents often co-op different spaces for their own pur purposes. So in the middle illustration on the, the bottom row, the, the second one from the left, that's a pavilion that sits outside the hospital these adolescents frequent, which has become their kind of meeting space and they call it their space within the hospital and that's where they go when they're spending the day in treatment to kind of make their own space, make their own time. So a sense of ownership and a sense of independence were important for them. And we, we concluded that um, there's various types of spaces that adolescents draw on for their health and well-being. And we developed these categories, which are spaces of privacy and safety, spaces of creativity, spaces of empowerment, spaces of freedom and spaces of enjoyment. Obviously, these categories don't correspond directly to physical spaces. Rather, they're about the embedded experience of spaces. So as an example, the park, which you see on the far right of those four illustrations, is a really important space because it's where they have free access to Wi-Fi. So by spending time in the park, it also facilitates access to a wider network of care and support and also enjoyment that they, they want to seek out through social media and, and other things. Another example is their bedrooms, which are both important as private spaces where they don't have to hide or you know, they, can, they can just be themselves but they also view them as creative spaces where they can do things that inspire them, such as singing, writing, or drawing. We found that all the adolescents were really creative and they used these as a kind of outlet and escape from, from their condition. So what I'd like to raise to the audience as a challenge is, yes, arguably we are facing healthcare crises in cities, but in order to address them, we might need to draw on things beyond the formal health system that we understand and to the standard conventions for healthcare delivery. So in this work in South Africa, we are framing this through this idea of spaces and systems of care. We found that throughout this project, living with HIV 
is really only one part of these adolescents' lives. And as we continue to need to deliver healthcare to a range of people across a range of populations and in different cities, particularly people living with chronic conditions when we've got a growth of non-communicable dis diseases, we have to think about designing and developing interventions that grapple with this bigger picture of people's lives and health. Thank you. <laughs>
But if you do live within a kilometre of a protected bikeway, it leads to about 45 more minutes more exercise biking and walking per week than living four kilometres away. Therefore, for every kilometre you live near to infrastructure that's safe, you are going to likely exercise about 15 minutes more per week. Which, in terms of guidance, is an imp if we did that on a population level, would be a huge increase in exercise levels. But we've heard potential benefits of extra exercise, however, are often offset by the pollution in the air that causes a diverse range of adverse health effects. Um, the 2017 Global Burden of Diseases project estimated air pollution is a leading risk factor that increases global mortality. And the UN Sustainable De Development Goals calls for major reduction in these pollutants. Now, I tried to, when you were talking about you, you, you suddenly went into someone I was thinking, fine particle mass. So we have this, this, you mentioned it in your talk, which was about this fine particle mass, which is anything less than 2.5 micrometers litre or the PM25 is really the obtainable goal. Anything above that you see these fine particles is an indicator of air pollution. While levels have declined in the last 25 years, however, in 2017, greater than 90% of the world's population still lives in areas where ambient PM2 5-point levels exceed the WHO's air quality guideline of 10 micrograms per metre cubed. And it was interesting, you mentioned Sydney, and I was out there in Sydney in December, and the newspaper's report, the level you reported was equivalent. You said it was 400 micrograms per metre cube, which was the same as the smoking in the, in the household, is equivalent to smoking about 37 cigarettes a day. Now, if you consider that's what we're doing in the population, you now understand some of the context of the problems we face. Um, 22 places in Oxfordshire breach air pollu pollution minute, limits on a daily basis. So, just to let you know, if you can do one or two things for your health, you should avoid the Woodstock Road and go up the Banbury Road, because the Woodstock Road avoids, uh, exceeds them limits. I live up towards Headington and I have to go through St. Clements, and actually if you live in East Oxford, St. Clements is the number one place for air pollutants in the city. Now, the third priority, which I think is really interesting, and this, this will roost, really come home, and China's another good example, is the role of urban design in preventing the spread of infectious diseases. And at the moment, we're all very worried about the coronavirus, but actually infectious diseases really are an interesting issue within the context of urbanisation. We, we're saying 70% of the world's population will be city dwellers by 2050. That's 2.5 billion more people living in urban areas. The physical environment is critical to urban areas. Access to safe drinking water, sanitation and drainage are vital. 673 million people don't have access to sanitation, for instance, and in 2012, half a million diarrheal deaths were estimated to be caused by inadequate drinking water and 280,000 deaths due to inadequate sanitation, all largely preventable. Something as simple as garbage collection that we often take for granted in high-income countries is associated with high levels of infections and parasitic diseases, including diarrheal disease, intestinal parasites and what we call water wash diseases. Now, it's interesting when you say these terms, if there are any historians in the room, they will start to think, well, let us not forget the 19th and 20th century created the city-dwelling conditions that actually worked very hard to reduce infections. And if, even if you go back in time, you can go back to the time of Henry VIII. Henry VIII's life expectancy was about 32 because he lived in London. But somehow, before the times of knowing about infections, he spent two years on the road when they had the sweating sicknesses and the plague, avoiding the city to avoid the infection. Therefore, infectious diseases are inextricably linked to our cities, to our proximity. As you sit in here now near to each other, this is a dangerous environment. <laughs> now, linking them all together, ex environmental exposures, as I said in the environment, are, are linked to infection. We've said that the global burden of disease study is important, but one thing is there's been a substantial decrease in the number of deaths from lower tra respiratory tract infections in under fives, a really important reduction. That's gone down from 2.3 million in 1990 to about 800,000 deaths in 2017. The largest decrease in that mortality is attributed to vaccination for haemophilus and for pneumococcal vaccine. But actually, number three on the list 
accounting for over 8% of the reduction, is reduction in household air pollution. So it's incredibly vital we continue to work towards uh, achieving these reductions in household pollution. Interestingly though, the burden in over 70s has increased in many regions around the world. So, lower respiratory tract infections remains a largely preventable disease and cause of death. Continued efforts should aim to decrease indoor and ambient air pollution. Wood burning stoves, as we've heard about, for instance, emit more harmful air particulates than diesel lorries. But domestic wood burning is the largest source of PM25, which is what you said, didn't you? It's really interesting. But when you see these e efforts like in London, and you think about London's low emission zone, the actual wood burning stones cancel out the first two phases of the emission zone. And if we're now in Oxford, we're about to have an emission zone that looks at the transport. So if it isn't integrated, we end up with these problems of just cancelling out. In fact, it's not a good idea to go exercising in somewhere like Sydney when the PM25 is through the roof because you've got significant problems. Therefore, the role of a city zone can support or damage health. Positive urban design should act to improve living conditions, improve access to health and social services, address the environmental exposures that contribute to NCDs and infection, and the, device, and the design features should really now think about contributing to our health and well-being. Cities play a vital role in health. This role will only grow. Cities have the potential to be health-generating spaces or hazardous spaces. The question is, which do we want now in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that, that really nicely ties up a lot of the comments made by all of our speakers and have been really interesting and thought-provoking. So now is the chance for you all to ask all the burning questions that I think you've hopefully stored up over the last, um, the last half an hour or so. So thank you again to our speakers and we are happy to take any questions from the audience. Everybody's a bit shell-shocked by just how badly it is and maybe thought about the fact they came down the Woodstock Road. I don't know. Yes, so. Yeah, um I'm, my name is Tony Bates, I'm a former uh, mature student at Clover College. I'm delighted to be here tonight on this particular subject because it's very topical. I don't know whether people have uh, seen today's media, television, and newspapers and so on about um, mental health and the crisis that we're facing <coughs> in the United Kingdom, costing £40 billion pounds a year, which is absolutely astonishing. But I have spent um, the last five or six years working with a neurologist, uh, principally, um, in Oxford um, on the subject of migraine. And migraine is a very important uh, uh, condition affecting, uh, it's interesting to listen to the list of uh, conditions that affect worldwide uh, large numbers of people. Migraine, I think, comes in as about number eight affecting older age groups. Um, and the Lancet in 2012 said that migraine had one billion sufferers worldwide. So it's pretty big and important in, in that field. Now, I feel that I have a tiger by the tail because um, five years ago, uh, having been a former migraine sufferer myself, 15 years ago, by chance and trial and error, I found a method to stop my own personal migraines. And remarkably, today, 15 years later, I spoke for the first time to someone else who had stopped their migraines in almost exactly the same way. So we had that in common. This is not known. John Professor, Emeritus Professor John Stein, when I talked to him about this some years ago, said we must find out whether the method you use works for other people. So a clinical trial, now, now known as a clinical study, because it couldn't be gold standard research. We couldn't hold captive the migraine sufferers for or before, during and after type studies on a functional MRI scanner. But the outcome of the clinical studies was that the method that I had found by trying to work and refinement actually worked virtually for everybody. Um, and the report of that clinical study, which only 
can have our capacity of scale, we can do EPR the things we've now completed the entire study, um, showed that seven out of eight people benefited from that particular self-induced quasi sort of natural remedy. Um, and what we're about to do is go to India for a large-scale trial to determine whether Professor Meredith, Professor John Stein's belief is that this is a universal remedy that might work for all neurological conditions, not simply migraine. We have, however, only tested migraine. 100 in Oxford University, the subject of the Ethics Committee clinical study report, um, and another 100 more widely um, in towns and cities up and down the UK who come across and heard about the, the uh, inquiries or the research that's being done at Oxford. Now, I want to pick the brains of the, the group here tonight, if that possible, said, how do I let go of the tiger by the tail safely? What do I do? I, I am the virtue, the sort of facilitator of that clinical trial. It was my experience that John Stein said, you must see whether it works for other people. One after the other, academics were completely astonished. This did work for other people time and time again. In fact, it's virtually never failed. So you know, that's the reason to have John says it's a universal number. It is uh, an exercise, a vocal uh, resonance exercise that has to be pretty well orchestrated. <coughs> Pretty precise in many ways, although it's homespun in others. Um, how, how, where do I go? Second question is the large scale consumer trial in India, we're talking about perhaps a thousand people that way, um, needs protocols to produce a report which might be valuable in moving this project forward. Even though so many people are affected by it, I have terrible experience with the Ukraine. And those of you who know about it, I'm sure, have the same. And I could get rid of my migraine just like that. How do I, what do I do about the next stage in terms of, of releasing it to, to a wider market? Uh, I think I mentioned in that, I think uh, the trial, the consumer trial, the clinical trial team, said that the cost of the UK economy is 3.42 billion. Perhaps I can answer that think, for you. Yeah. I mean, it's not really relevant to healthcare urbanisation, yeah. but there are 40,000 randomised control trials every year. Yeah. Only about 500 of them get into practice, and of them, about 100 get into clinic, into guidelines like NICE. You need to drive up with somebody who does randomised control trials. You have to give up your position and make it independent of yeah. your own belief, yeah. and then go forward. The, um, for, if you can show a difference in 100 p patients that's statistically significant in a clinical trial, somebody like the Lancet will accept it if it's got a clinically important difference. But the number of studies and people that we see come along with very small, that translates into practice. It takes about 20 years and about one in 100 go forward. Yeah. So that's where we are, but I'm not sure there's a real question on urban yeah. healthcare there. So, uh, Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, and I think that addresses yes. that question. And I that's what we do all the time, and yeah. in evidence-based healthcare, all the time. And I would I say think. then that, sort of, in terms of addressing yeah. sort of healthcare with urbanisation, this is where we want to also look at what research can we do, and what does the research say about those, <coughs> just like sort of the kind of work that Hubert is doing, really looking at what is going on and how we might address some of those things. So, do we have some questions from the audience, thinking about these elements? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. How do you actually go about? changing the mindset of people who want to light a fire all the time because mm. you know, they've always written with the fire in their parents to make on parents. Yeah, so, yeah, I'd love to, maybe both, you, you and Hubert, my person, you might like, would like to give yeah. that a go, but I'll let yeah. Lucy have a start, yeah. Well, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing and uh, changing people's ingrained, mm. you know, behaviours of things they've done for years and years is really hard. In fact, mm. Practical Action works on energy, uh, clean cooking and, and access to electricity in <coughs> places. So we have some experience of trying to uh, help people to, to, to you know, shift to cleaner ways of cooking. Um, and I think one thing, and, and we've had uh, staff members have, have come to me sometimes and said, well, you know, I took this clean stove to my, my uh, grandmother in the village in, in Zimbabwe, and she only gets it out when I come to visit. <laughs> And I can tell that because it's still, it's a bit dusty around the edges. It's not being used. So, 
so yeah, there are a lot. There are lots of issues. I think. I think there's actually the the one thing it's worth saying around this is that there's a huge amount of experience that can be shared between changing behaviours in lots of different fields. So how do you how do you try to encourage people to wash their hands? How do you try to encourage people to when they need to? How do you encourage? It, it's there are similar things. Um, and one of the one of the most important messages that I've learned, not as a, a, a behaviour change practitioner, but as some, something to kind of that's really stuck with me, is that you have to not you have to tell people how the thing that they're going to use makes them tunes in with their posit with positive visions of what they want to be that by using these kinds of stoves you are uh, a a caring family and uh, part of the modern world and if you tell people you cook like that you're going to kill your children they'll go nah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that, but I still, you're still not giving me a reason to. You're still not giving me a reason to change. And so, a lot of what we've done with a lot of cook stove producers in uh, in, in East Africa, for example, is to is to work with a uh, a marketing company to kind of promote some of those messages about like a modern modern family, a modern mum, a modern a modern dad who helps with that. And they've had also a couple of kind of TV shows, which have been one of them is called Shamba Chef, where they've gone around doing a kind of kitchen makeover. Okay in lots of rural kitchens. They've celebrated people's local cuisine in different parts of, the, of Kenya, but also the challenge has been to cook it on a, new, on a new cook stove so that people can say, look, you cook it on this and it still tastes great. So, so there have been all the, like, lots of just sort of really innovative, positive ways exactly. and not telling people that I think it links bad in stuff. with some of the things also that Michaela was talking about, how we're using space and getting people to use space. I think I'll briefly let Hubert maybe just jump in on that. Yes. I mean, I, my... Short answer to this is it will need intervention from the state. And I think one, one of the things that uh, people have been doing is uh, you might not notice, but there are uh, several NGOs working on actually trying to introduce new cook stoves or improved cook stoves around the world. So that cannot be done by you know, just changing one person, but they're changing it completely you know, for the entire country you know, or across other countries because it needs supply chain. Because it, it, it's not simply says I give you the cook stove, you're going to use it. It needs maintenance. You know, it needs all all sorts of things. You know, you you have to get um, the cleaner fuels. You know, all sorts of things. It needs to be there as well in place. So it needs state intervention. It needs something much larger scale. When when the uh, infrastructure is in place, it's almost like the market will possibly or quite possibly drive people. You know, to use the, use the new technology, you know, when you almost like you can't have access to older technologies. The other thing that I want to highlight is um, in public health, we're talking about shifting the population averages. So one example is uh, sugar tax. You know, by, by the introduction of sugar tax, the industry, voluntary or involuntary, changed their recipe, basically, by reducing the sugar con uh, content such that they're not taxed as much so that, you know, even if you're not changing your diet, you're still drinking Coke two times a day, three times a day, but your sugar content, your, your sugar intake will be lowered. And so I, I guess, you know, it is, as, as you said, you know, we have to target individual levels and trying to change the behavior. But in a population level, you know, we probably will not be able to go and visit each individual household, knock on the door and trying to understand what you can do, what you can't do. We have to do something behind us in trying to do one size fits all things, but that really needs strong will from government from, uh, you know, across different countries, you know, to do this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hubert. Yeah. Thank you. The, um, I can I just pick, there's of loads course, of very yes, interesting yes, well, points. You just, you pick up on this idea of population approaches and that's a really interesting concept, the difference between individual approaches and population approaches. So, if, for instance, if an individual approach might be, I'm a GP and I'm going to try and get you to lose weight. A population approach might be, you're going to have a sugar tax, so that applies to everybody equally. And when we think about the environment, it's a population approach, so it has the potential to have much more impact than individual approaches. And there's a very good book I recommend to all my students, is Jeffrey Rose's Strategy of Preventive Disease, which says that basically the average predicts the deviance. Therefore, we're all responsible for the deviance. Therefore, if we exercise more and the average exercise goes more, 
then actually the people who are low exercisers will track with us. And actually the whole of the population will get healthier if we do that. But in terms of the, 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 the two issues that are really interesting to me is, I think to show a difference, where I think we, we can say that the stoves is an issue, but can we show that there's a, a, a clinically important difference if we change the behaviour? And I think what we're missing at the moment is an evidence-based approach to do that. We've got the epidemiology, we understand the pollutants, but we don't understand the impact on the 235 million asthmatics. If you do this, what happens at a population level to asthma? Does it get better? And if it does that, we've got a huge impact. And my second point in all this is, which is the important aspect, is the inequity and the inequality here. Because it always disproportionately affects people at the low income scale. So we tend to build these environments that appeal to the middle and upper class and then increase inequality. And actually we can do much better at population level, but I do think we've got to show these clinically important differences in the diseases that matter. Yeah, just to add on, I, I mean, from say from the example of the Kaluma project, well, the biggest way to show that someone's living well with HIV is their, their viral load. There's a very clear numerical value to how healthy or not they are with their HIV. But from the wider Kaluma project, one of the things that was reported with the adolescent mentors using this text messaging service was the sessions where a counsellor or an expert came in and sort of actually tried to take them through health issues and the risks associated with not taking their medication were not responded to very well. People weren't participating very eagerly. Um, this, we weren't actually, well, the SHM Foundation weren't able to track by number the impact of this. But the moments where the adolescents were talking about other topics, having friendly conversations, and one of them might say something like, I'm feeling really low today, I just couldn't face taking my medication. The other adolescents would chip in and say, no man, come on, you have to, like this is good for you. And, and actually it was this ground up support that they were building for each other that seemed to be generating the kind of drive and motivation to, to, to look after themselves. As you said, we need evidence for these things and there's a long way to go, I think, to really be able to, to say that's what what works but I think that that kind of ground up approach and, and building those networks and allowing someone to motivate themselves to make those behaviour changes is a really crucial part. And creating the spaces that let lets yeah. that happen and thinking about how we might design cities or spaces or interventions in that way yeah. if the urban environment or the environment that they live in that actually facilitates all that or you know facilitates yeah. also you know people supporting each other in using the new technology or the new stove or mm. whatever it might be. I think that is definitely a key, for me, a key take home from this, this really great discussion. Do we have more questions from you? Yes. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Thank you for all your presentations. But on the Kaluma project, in terms of the, the next steps for that community, uh, any sort of changes or uh, additional investments that would sort of respond to some of the findings that you've mm. had there? So that's something we're, we're kind of still reflecting on at the moment. Um, the, the, pro the main Kaluma project, which I'm not directly involved in, this, this was a sort of independent bit of research, is ongoing and they're starting a new set of groups. So the, the kind of counselling support service is, is a kind of ongoing learning thing. Out of this, something we're, we're questioning is, well, the project, the Kaluma project is doing something good for these adolescents' lives, but how might that relate back to the formal health service and the kind of care program that they're being delivered by the state, particularly for adolescents. So we're having discussions about can we, you know, propose ideas for what an adolescent care service would look like that might be specific and different to a paediatric or an adult mm -hmm. care service. Um, there's lots of ideas, but it's it's kind of an ongoing thing. And I mean, actually, at the moment in Pretoria, there's been a lot of kind of unrest so there's also been a kind of quietening down of the ability to think about new things and stuff. Um, but that I think is a really interesting point which brings back I think some of the points that were made by the speakers mm -hmm. is if you have an environment that is conducive for you to be able to then address those issues more yeah. I think that has a huge impact and I think Lucy 
you definitely touched on that element as well. If you start to take away the, it's difficult for me to wash my hands, you've not only done that, you've actually created some space, let's say mental or whatever it might be, to start to address some other things, or if you have environment spaces that are not safe, yeah. that, then that's the immediate worry, and you don't have then that sort of broader space, let's say, to think <coughs> about how might I address other things. So I, th I think you, mm. if I'm right, you mentioned mm. some of those elements, so I think that is really important. A quick final question before we wrap up, no? I think there's really lots to think about, so I would like to very, very much thank all of our speakers and also absolutely. <laughs>